I've often said that going to work is like reading a collection of short stories every day. And I remember coming up to a patient. And she kept saying, sure enough, sure enough. His father was uh, screaming for help. I had to tell her that he was gone. He gave me a hug and said, thanks for saving my life. You can't believe the gift that it is to be exposed to so many people's lives in such an intimate way. That's a powerful gift. And I think about that at the end of every shift. The emergency room really is the people's room. It's the place where they can come 24-7, 365 days of the year. Whoever you are, whatever your need, we're here to take care of you. I'll tell you a story. My dad was a GP surgeon whose office was in his house. So medicine was a big part of our lives. I treated my first emergency when I was about eight years old. My dad was a very hardworking physician and he was out making house calls. And I was home alone. And uh, the doorbell rang and there was the a neighborhood grocer with a broken wrist. He had been cranking his truck and it backed on him, which will tell you something about my age when the ignitions were still manual. And even an eight-year-old could look at that wrist and know it was broken. And I remember thinking, do I put hot or do I put cold on that? And I decided cold because I thought it would make it feel better. And I went up to the kitchen and got a dish towel, wrapped his wrist, and put it in an ice tray and covered it with ice, gave him two aspirin, said, Dad, I'll be home in an hour. But I don't think I did so badly in retrospect. And he ended up uh, sending me a case of bananas and not paying my father's fee, which really ticked him off. <laughs> the story of modern emergency medicine began right after World War II. America was emerging from years of depression and conflict, and we were a nation on the move. It wasn't like the early 1900s where people were born, lived, and died in the same community. Now people were more mobile, changing their address every few years. The brand new interstate highway system would make it easier than ever for people to move far from their roots to unfamiliar cities and suburbs, where they had no family connections and no family doctor. American medicine was changing too. Family doctors being replaced by specialists. They didn't make house calls, and they didn't like to see patients outside of office hours. So it was a time of big change, a lot of medical advancement, new technology, uh, too big, too expensive to fit into the doctor's little black bag, and that all moved into the hospitals. All of these changes were bringing more people to hospitals for medical care, especially in an emergency but hospitals weren't ready. What we today know as emergency medicine and emergency care uh, was essentially a room in the basement of the hospital, uh, where some suturing was done, maybe an asthmatic was treated. What was it called in the early days? 
It wasn't an emergency room. It was called the pit. And that's what it was. There were exposed pipes and <laughs> dripping water, and it went into an area that had four little treatment spaces, basically a stretcher, uh, and then there was a GYN room. It sort of had a loading dock look to it, and they, over that was, it was it said emergency, and someone had tacked on a sign, uh, if it's an emergency, ring the bell. There was a kid who fell out of a tree, picked up by the cops and brought by the squad car to the closest hospital. They buzzed on the bell ringer. Nurse opened the door, uh, answered the door. They explained what was going on. She said, you'll have to take him to the qualified hospital. We can't handle head injuries here. So they did. The kid later died. They were very small. They were crowded places. Some actually thought we should decrease the size of the emergency department, increase the waiting time so people wouldn't come there. Emergency rooms had bigger problems than leaky pipes and long waiting times. The staffing was done by the interns. So the least experienced physicians took care of most dangerous situations. Mr. Wood? Mr. Wood? Their opinion was, the ER is the best place to learn. This is where we've got to put the brand new doctors. They don't need supervision. They don't really need a specialist showing them what to do. I, of course, was one of the interns who uh, was doing that in my internship and realized how ill-prepared I was. As a, a young emergency physician, I was scared because I knew how little I knew and how incompetent I was. My dad was 64 when he died of pulmonary edema. His cardiologist wouldn't come to see him when he went to the emergency department where he was cared for by an intern the same year I was interning. I wouldn't have known how to take care of him. I began to think to myself, there's got to be a better way. This just doesn't make too much sense. I have seen hundreds and thousands of patients. One case I remember was a man who was shot 11 times in the mountains, an old moonshiner. His nephew put him in a pickup truck and brought him to the emergency department. I worked very hard to trying to save this old guy. Uh, and eventually did, and of course then he had to have several surgeries and so on. And of course he was one of those people who doesn't pay, he didn't have any money. Months went by and it was a Christmas day, and there was a, a doorbell rang and my wife went to the door, came said that it's a farmer who wants to talk to you. So I went out there, see this guy is there, his overalls and the pickup truck, he says, hi doc, he says, you remember me? He says, I was shot 11 times. You took care of me. I said, well, I'm glad to see that you're doing well. So he went to his truck and brought me a ham, a country ham and a jug of moonshine. And we enjoyed the ham. The 1960s would prove to be a turning point in emergency medicine. As the new decade dawned, America went through a change in leadership and a change in attitude. The problems are not all solved, and the battles are not all won. And we stand today on the edge of a new frontier. It was a time of rising expectations and a new determination to tackle the country's toughest issues. The crisis in emergency care would call for creative solutions. In some places, like Pontiac, Michigan, they tried staffing the emergency room with part-time help from other departments. Well, if you were on the staff of Pontiac Hospital, you might pull three shifts a month doing the ER and the rest of the time running your office practice. Well, this new model came to be known as the Pontiac Plan. 
physicians who worked part-time in ERs, they were attending physicians, so it was a step up from the interns and residents. But the downside was that they were from various specialties with various levels of training. So as a patient, you didn't know what kind of doctor you were going to get. It was a little bit of a crapshoot. They didn't have a neurosurgeon on call. They didn't have an orthopedic surgeon on call. You had one person, and they had to rotate this. Can you imagine coming in with a broken leg or an appendicitis and talking to a dermatologist? Oh, I'm so glad you're here, doctor. And the guy says, I'm no doctor, I'm the dermatologist. Poor dermatologists, they get beat up on whenever we tell these stories. And, uh, that was crazy, that was just bad. That was the Pontiac problem, brilliant. And it was also the Pontiac problem. <laughs> that was an interesting slip of the tongue. A few doctors tried a different approach. One of them was Dr. James Mills, a general practitioner in Alexandria, Virginia. I remember thinking, this tired and overworked GP, I wasn't being fair to myself, my family, or my patients. It came to me, with regular hours, I would be able to practice much better medicine. If I could get three other good men to join me, we'd have a team that could provide top-notch treatment at all hours. Jim Mills and some of his colleagues, they were all physicians who worked in the ER. They realized the way ERs were being run was very, very bad for patient care. In 1961, Mills persuaded three other doctors to join him and take over the emergency room of Alexandria Hospital. They would be the first full-time emergency physicians. The hospital board and the city agreed to the plan. It seemed like a good idea to them. But for Mills and his colleagues, it was a risky undertaking. And it was a huge step for him to do that. He was a very respected internist in the community in Alexandria, Virginia. And for him to decide to stop his practice, because he, he had to tell his patients, I'm, I'm done. I don't have a private practice. I only work in the emergency department. And they would say, can I come and see you there? And he said, uh, only if you have an, an emergency. The Alexandria plan looked more uh, viable because although you got to work in the ER and you, uh, when you started, it was because you decided this is what I'm going to do, and I'm wor you worked in the ER. Mill's experiment was a success, and it attracted a fair amount of publicity and a few imitators. Around the country, other doctors were experimenting setting up a variety of full-time emergency medicine programs, staffed by doctors who only worked in the ER. One of them was in Lansing, Michigan. The doctor who started it was John Wigenstein. I had a huge practice, a solo practice. So whenever they had an emergency that one of my patients would get in an automobile accident, I was right there. I loved that part. They would cancel all my appointments, and I would go suture and take care of this diabetic out of control and whatever. I just went to the emergency department, whatever chance I had. John Wigginston had an idea, if this field is to move on, needs to be some kind of an organization, just like all other specialties. So John and a total of eight people in Michigan incorporated American College of Emergency Physicians. Wigenstein didn't really set out to form a new medical specialty. For him, it was all about the training, about the education of these new full-time emergency physicians who had gaps in their knowledge so that they could practice better emergency medicine. He thought that that would improve patient outcomes and save lives. And so, in August 1968, ASEP was born. It seemed like a great idea, but it still only had eight members. By coincidence, just a few months later, all these new emergency care providers around the country were invited to a conference in Fairfax, Virginia to set up a national organization. Wigenstein and his colleagues from Michigan felt like they already had a head start. To look more official, they quickly printed up a set of bylaws and membership cards and designed a logo. We arrived with the ink still drying on the materials. I, I got up and presented the American College of Emergency Physicians to this group, passed out the literature, membership applications. 
and they said, well, it's already been formed, so let's just join it. And so that's how it happened. It was a small group of physicians who really had the courage and the vision to get together and say, we've got to change things. Probably a goodly number would say, well, they saw the need to improve. They saw the need to bring better methods to the emergency. Uh-uh. It wasn't just that. They wanted to demonstrate doctors could make a living in an emergency department. One thing that most emergency physicians probably wonder is how do all of their patients do as they move forward in life? Did they make the impacts that they wanted to? In the late 60s, there was a two-year-old that arrives in the emergency department at St. Lawrence Hospital in Lansing. Not moving, not breathing, blue. His father was uh, screaming for help. John Wiegenstein was on. But he'd never done surgical airway on a child before. He didn't really have any other options. He performed a uh, emergency tracheotomy. And uh, that's where I first met John. 17 years later, I introduced myself to him. I said, you probably don't remember me. But you know, you saved my life when I was two years old. And I told him at that time I was applying to medical school and things were going well. When John passed away in 2004, I found this article that he had written about the emergence of emergency medicine. He kind of chronicled the story of, of, of me. I had finished my emergency medicine residency, which I did in Lansing, a program that John started. As much as we try to separate our personal lives from our professional lives, for me, emergency medicine has been about both. To say that he had an impact on me would be an understatement. To this day, as I work in the emergency department, I'm still amazed that he was able to do what he did. I really wouldn't be here without him. By the late 60s, America was in the throes of a cultural revolution. And thanks to pioneers like John Wigenstein, the revolution in emergency medicine was well underway. But there were those in the medical establishment who just weren't keen on this brand new specialty. People honestly believed we weren't a specialty and should not be recognized. That we didn't perform those things that made us specialty. No research, no real education policies. They really didn't think we belonged. One of their toughest critics was a surgeon named Ken Maddox. What was the unique body of knowledge that belongs only to the emergency department? that made this a specialty of medicine. Emergency medicine, in truth, are primary care physicians that are triage officers. Medicine, you know, perceived as a conservative force, but this was a force that seemed to be totally out of touch with what the people I saw or felt about needed care from. There were a countable number of times that people said emergency medicine would be developed over their dead bodies. Competition. Turf. It's always money. It's always money. If we got in there, we would get more of the cut, and they would get less of the cut. It was obvious that there'd have to be a battle, and uh, we'd have to get good people who wanted to fight in a battle. In spite of all the resistance from inside the House of Medicine, emergency medicine grew quickly. It seemed to attract a certain kind of young doctor. The early people were, were clearly mavericks, uh, and some of them were frankly a little crazy. They weren't just maverick, they were LSD doing communist something. They were just very different. 
I mean, to go and say, I'm going to create a specialty where one doesn't exist, you had to have some cojones to do that. I mean, that was, that was some battles. They said, well, you've thrown away your career. That's it. You'll never amount to anything. They said, I should be seen by the shrink. Because uh, no one with real talent and intelligence would spend their life in the emergency department. Some of the people, uh, quite frankly, uh, had personalities that were abrasive. That wasn't good. I guess they'd probably say the same thing about me. <laughs> you would hear these amazing stories of these wild and woolly early days of emergency medicine where surgery residents and emergency medicine residents would be in confrontations all the time, uh, even attending physicians, and sometimes it'd spill out into the parking lot into fistfights. I often wonder if I had been a different person, could I have had fewer fights? Certainly, I had a, a quick temper and didn't mind fighting for my department and my prerogatives. But I don't think with those kinds of people around that I could have avoided them. I decided I wanted to go to medical school because I thought I could fuse my interest in personal rights and human rights and health, and science. I, I understood what I thought medicine should be, but I, you know, when I walked in to Johns Hopkins in 1963, you know, you could go through a, uh, the colored file, you could go through the white doors. You know, when there were very few women, there were no, in it was the first black student ever accepted Johns Hopkins in my class. This poor guy was being, essentially the first black guy was there to be uh, humiliated to my extent, it was tough. So uh, they lost interest in me. I was active in uh, civil rights demonstrations and they said I had to shape up, fix my tie, you know, do stuff like that. And so ultimately I didn't make it and I, they said I wasn't qualified to stay. So I went to what was then the University of Brussels in Belgium. There was a socialized healthcare system. Everybody had access to care. It's very exciting. So race, segregation, uh, access to care for people, all those things were really my first experiences with healthcare. I, I think that's how my foundation was created, and that's sort of the way I've done emergency medicine for most of my career. Four days of rioting, looting, and arson rocked the city of Detroit in the worst outbreak of urban racial violence this year. At least 36 are killed, more than 2,000 injured, and damage topped the half billion mark. Back in the late 1960s, urban America was seething with crime and racial tension, and inner city ERs had to deal with it. He received multiple lacerations and a possible concussion by Billy Club. I got called by my chief resident, and he said, uh, Ron, have you got your television on? And we're going to need you to come in. And I went in, and I put on a pair of greens, and I moved into Detroit receiving. There were a lot of uh, looters who came to triage with uh, broken jaws. We were following this stuff in the newspaper, and there was a report in the paper, like 45 dead, uh, and we had more than 45 dead at our hospital, so we knew the numbers were fudged. Judith Tintinali joined Ron Crome at Detroit Receiving a few years later. By then, the riots were a distant memory, but the inner city was still a violent place. It was the Wild West. Everything that happened happened in the emergency department. A lot of trauma, gunshots, stabs. We had a police station there. The sheriff was always there. The newspapers were always there. It was a very exciting place. That kind of excitement was certainly not limited to Detroit. I remember my cab ride. I said, I'm going to Denver General Hospital, and he says, the fucking knife and gun club. I remember him saying, that's a, that was his first words out of his mouth. Photographer Eugene Richards spent months documenting the daily dramas in the emergency room at Denver General Hospital. Going into that room on the weekend, and every room would be packed, and chaos would be, and people would be screaming and the police would be dragging people out and the noises and the, 
and the sirens, and and uh, and yet there was a somehow they would calm it down until it worked. To watch people go from asleep to walking in, clearing their minds, and simply doing impossible tasks. And it was breathtaking. People don't understand it. For decades, the American military had been perfecting a coordinated system of emergency medicine, more advanced than anything in the civilian world. On the battlefields of Vietnam, medics were embedded with combat units so they could treat wounded soldiers as soon as they fell. This is Dynamite 5 to uh, request dust off. The critically wounded were transported immediately to hospitals to be cared for by doctors prepared to deal with their injuries. Back home, Emergency medicine was just getting started, and coordinated pre-hospital care didn't exist. There was no organized EMS. It, it was terrible. You had a better chance of surviving if you were shot in a battlefield in Vietnam than if you were shot in the streets of Detroit. Most ambulance services were stretch Cadillacs. And the two guys in the ambulance wore white uniforms. It could be somebody who had been a store clerk the week before. It's really what it was. No different than a cab driver. The ambulance transport vehicle was a, a funeral hearse. And if there was a bad accident on the highway and multiple ambulances showed up, they weren't fighting over the living patients. They were fighting over the people who'd been killed because those brought revenue to the funeral homes. There were a number of people that went to Vietnam who saw how rapidly they could be treated. And I saw that firsthand myself. And they came home and, you know, they were accustomed to being taken care of quickly. And they told a lot of people about that. And so there was a lot of uh, thrust from people that knew this could be better. Veterans and emergency doctors realized that you didn't have to be a physician to make a difference. You just had to know what to do, and you had to do it fast. Dr. Eugene Nagel shared his skills with a new group of emergency care providers. They were the ones who got to the patients first. I went down to Miami Fire Department to their main station, and that got me hooked into fire rescue and the thought that someday we could do outside the hospital what we were doing inside the hospital to save lives. And uh, that was a singular event in my life. In 1967, Nagel and a colleague came up with a radical new idea. Connect the guys in the field with doctors in the ER. They equipped a Miami rescue vehicle with a radio and EKG telemetry gear. Now technicians in the field could communicate directly with ER doctors and begin the process of diagnosis and treatment before the patient ever arrived at the hospital. It revolutionized pre-hospital care. But what should they call these newly trained pre-hospital emergency personnel? Medic, which was used in World War II, sounded too much like doctor, and the paratroops had paramedics. My fireman guys liked the term, so that's what we called them in Miami, and the name stuck. 
We had a lot of opposition. The bureaucracy was dead set against having firemen, untrained barbarians, giving drugs and, and doing medical procedures. But the press and the media, they were like a tidal wave. The newspapers ate us up. There would be pictures or articles practically every week. And we didn't mind as long as the public knew that we were there and that we were there for one reason, to take care of them. The lessons of the battlefield were starting to make it to the home front, at least in a few places. But getting the whole country on board wasn't an easy process. In 1973, when Congress took up a national EMS bill for the third time, Dr. David Boyd was called to testify. He was the chief health officer for Illinois, which had a statewide EMS program. Well, they were all politicians from the South and East arguing for subsidization for their untrained ambulances, many of which were mortician driven. I said, we don't need another transportation program. What we need is a system in this country, a regionalized system. We've done this in Illinois. Here's the program, here's our data, and I'll leave this with you. And I start to walk away. The staffer, he said, Dr. Boyd, could you stay over for a couple days and help us with this legislation? So I stayed over and actually wrote the Emergency Medical Services Systems Act. So the EMS Act of 1973 was the huge federal boost that was needed to help establish both regional and municipal EMS systems across the country. It provided a lot of money. It was big money going into both equipment and ambulances and communications, uh, but, but probably more importantly, the training of personnel who were gonna deliver this pre-hospital care. Emergency medicine in the ER and the field was catching on fast. It gained hero status with a primetime TV series called, appropriately enough, Emergency. Rampart Rescue 51. Rampart Rescue 5-1. Emergency featured courageous rescues by a team of paramedics. Go ahead, 51. Who worked closely with doctors and nurses back in the ER. Vehicle over the cliff, three patients, one male, two female. Compound fractures both legs, acute pain. First female, approximately 40. Fractured radius and ulna, right arm. Do what you can, immobilize those fractures. <laughs> Once emergency medicine got off the ground, it quickly attracted new recruits. And these would-be emergency physicians needed specialized training for their new line of work. But getting that training wasn't easy. Today, there are over 200 emergency medicine residencies in this country. In 1970, there were zero. And at that time, most people in the medical establishment and in academic medicine really didn't see the need in this little tiny hospital in Kentucky. This was a, a reasonable little place that probably had 20 or some beds, but they wanted, the, they had an emergency department which was open, saw very few people, but they needed somebody to cover. So they hired senior medical students for the incredible sum of $45 a night, which I thought was an incredible sum at the time. And uh, so I, I did that, and, but the first shift was something you'll, now I'll never forget, as I, I took my little bag, which at the time used to get a bag from the Lilly Company as a senior medical student, and I, I got out and walked, and this, this nurse comes out and said, I'm glad you're here, we have a cardiac arrest upstairs. And uh, my response was probably pretty typical for a medical student, oh my God, I have no idea what to do. So I went to the scene, watched the nurses do things to the patient, agreed that the patient was dead, and decided either I'm gonna learn how to do this right, or I quitting. So I decided to learn how to do it right. As he was completing his senior year of med school at the University of Cincinnati, Bruce Janiak took his new passion for emergency medicine to a new level in a way that no one had ever done before. I met several times with these professors and the idea of how to do it we discussed and they told me if I would agree to stay in Cincinnati for at that time a rotating internship, which was the first year that most everybody did. Uh, they would agree to uh, accept me as a resident in this new specialty, which no, we didn't ask anybody else. We just said, we'll call this an emergency medicine residency. 
It wasn't an officially recognized program. It wasn't accredited by the medical establishment. But Bruce Janiak became the very first emergency medicine resident. And other med students were getting the same idea. I grew up in New Jersey. Went to Medical College of Pennsylvania, which was women's med when I went there. My roommate was a year ahead of me, and she was on duty in the emergency department. And I took her dinner one night, and then something happened. It was just like, wow, here's where I want to be. In the fall of my senior year, I was about seven months pregnant, and I got my lunch and walked into the cafeteria. And I sat down, and opposite me was David Wagner, and he asked what I was going to do the next year. I said, what I want to do doesn't exist. I want to be an emergency physician. As it turns out, they had just been talking about starting an emergency medicine program, but didn't think anybody would take it. Now, you know, <laughs> what are the chances? Being a woman in medicine in the 70s was pretty interesting. When I started medical school in the classes, the five classes right before mine, there were maybe three or four or five women in those classes. In my class, there were 15. That was enormous. But it just goes to show how rare a duck a woman was at that point. When I was in my neurosurgery residency, I would go to the surgeries, but I couldn't go in the doctor's lounge. That was for men only. So I would have to sit on a stretcher outside the uh, doctor's lounge waiting on my attending while the male residents went in and, and got that intimate teaching that you can get in that setting. I was the first woman elected to the ASEP board. And what Nancy says about not going into the doctor's lounge, my very first ASEP board meeting, we're having a very heated discussion over some topic just before lunch, and they decided before we vote, we maybe need more discussion, so let's break for lunch. So we're all walking out of the room and we're talking about this issue, and they all walk into the men's room. And I thought, you know, they don't have anything I haven't seen before numerous times. So I'll just go in and we can continue the discussion. And then I thought, no, if I walk in there, the discussion's obviously going to change. So I went to the ladies' room, and when we got back to the board room after uh, lunch, I raised my hand and I said, I have a motion to make. And that is that any discussion of substantial issues cease when we walk out of the boardroom. Otherwise, I'd be happy to join them in the men's room. If this brand new specialty was going to mean anything, it had to have an official board to examine and certify the residents. But getting that board approved by the American Board of Medical Specialties was tough. In fact, the first time they took up the question in 1977, the vote was 100 to 5 against. With no certifying board, there really was no emergency medicine specialty. The first vote was terrible. I mean, I can't tell you how devastating we all found that. Well, I mean, the air went out of the balloon and the rose tints came off the glasses. I remember after jumping through hoops for almost five years, and someone said, well, things are coming along well. Another four or five years, you'll probably get a positive vote. And I blew my top, as I was wont to do, and said, fuck it, we'll just give our own exam and the hell with you. And those who said, you know, screw them. We don't need that. We don't need them. We can do our own thing. And I was like, hey, let's see if we can't figure a way to make this work. Creating a new room in the House of Medicine would be an uphill battle. ER doctors had to make the case for their new specialty and prove that it had a basis in science. Their critics weren't pulling any punches. There were so many in the medical establishment who weren't quite convinced about the legitimacy of this new field. And they had no problem voicing their concerns to early leaders like uh, Ron Crome and Judy Tintinale. I've never told this story. 
I banged on the table and I said, Judy, you and Ron, of all people, have submitted nothing in the past two to three years. I think you're fake. I don't know why you even started this emergency medicine. The room was silent for 60 seconds and Ron Crome was the first to speak. And he said, Ken's called our hand. He said, gentlemen, ladies, uh, we better produce. And I stood up, walked around the table, shook his hand. In terms of getting recognition, that was a, an evolution that had to occur for the field to develop. I think the way we fought the battle earned us an awful lot of uh, respect from the other specialties. We do have a, a scientific basis for what we do that's way deeper than even we thought it was. It was a very scary time, but it worked because people were willing to look at compromise, and that included the internists and the pediatricians. For nearly two years, the leaders of emergency medicine courted the medical establishment. They had to persuade them that trained emergency physicians have a unique role to play in delivering critical care. After all, they have to master the knowledge of a half dozen different specialties, and they have to do things other specialists can't do. It may be believed that because you're a doctor, because you graduate from medical school and you have an MD or DO degree, that you know everything. But no one has received the kind of training at all that enables them to deal with emergencies. That is not the focus of medical school training. It is not to recognize and treat time-sensitive illness or acute problems, strokes, heart attacks, serious infections, anaphylaxis where your throat closes up. They're just, just to name a few. You really need special training to recognize and treat emergencies. The frequency and the acuity of the things you have to deal with on a regular basis and the uncertainty with which you have to be comfortable. The inordinate multitasking, the constant interruptions, the ability to interface with so many different individuals in such a short time frame and, and with great composure and ease, I think was not an intuitive concept to, to a lot of physicians. They succeeded in proving their case. In 1979, when the question of a specialty board was reconsidered, the outcome was completely different. The vote was overwhelmingly the opposite in favor of establishing emergency medicine as a certifying board in the American Board of Medical Specialties. Besides the actual founding of ASEP, the founding of the American Board of Emergency Medicine and its acceptance by the other specialties was the critical event, uh, a board which the other boards would recognize as legitimate. Because then you had a seat at the table. What's the prototypical, perfect ER doc? I've thought about that a lot. Somebody who enjoys a lot of stress and never knowing what's gonna happen the next second. You cannot uh, anticipate what's gonna walk through the door, be dragged through the door, roll through the door, etc. and you have to be prepared for everything. They gotta be smart. Um, they have to enjoy adrenaline. Adrenaline junkies. Do you occasionally hit people? Yeah, do they sometimes hit you? Yes, they do. Uh, do you have to strap people down? Yep. We act in an environment that is fast-paced and information poor. How much time do you think we spend with a patient talking to them in the ER? Two to three minutes, max. If we were kids today, we'd all be diagnosed with ADHD. Be able to leave one intense situation, walk over to the next bed, and not carry that with you. To be able to switch it off in the 10 steps it takes you to get to the next bed, because that person doesn't need the baggage of the other thing that you just experienced. But then they have to have this other thing that is about able to make people feel comfortable really fast. The humanity, the 
ability to be in a specialty where you get to interact with so many different patients. We love the opportunity to be able to save a life. That's the most fulfilling um, thing that we do as doctors and that's something we have the privilege of doing more regularly in emergency medicine. And people with boundless energy. Uh, in their spare time they might be mountain climbers, triathletes. We probably also drink too much and party too hard and do lots of bad things. And somebody who can cry. If you can't cry, if I stop crying with, with relatives of the deceased, I'm gonna quit. Maybe not every day you get a chance to um, save a life. Oh, sorry. It's actually my alarm telling me I'm going on shifts in a half hour. <laughs>
And um, I went up to him and I said, Mr. Bober, stand up. And Mr. Bober was dead in the wheelchair. And uh, I, uh, it was just a very, very um, emotional um, day. So I went to a phone and I called the news media. <laughs> because I figured we had tried everything else to try to get them to be admitted. People have died in Jackson's emergency room because there is and a monster. Within 20 minutes, somebody was there taking footage. And at that 11 o'clock news that night, uh, the breaking story was, was this. And the next day, the patients got admitted. For better or worse, emergency doctors are governed and guided by their conscience. They've always been among the first to stand up for people in need who are neglected or ignored. We're like the Emma Lazarus poem under the Statue of Liberty. Send us your poor, your tired, those people without insurance, and uh, we'll take them in. People who couldn't pay for medical care were once routinely turned away from private hospitals and delivered to public hospital ERs, like the one run by Arthur Kellerman in Memphis, Tennessee. It was a morning shift. Two Memphis paramedics are rolling up the hallway with a patient. I knew this young man is critically ill. And I'm going to do my primary survey. I'm checking airway, I'm checking breathing, and I reached to check his radial pulse, and I brushed a bright, mint condition, yellow hospital wristband. Now, this is important because my hospital's wristbands were powder blue. And I flipped it over, and it was the name of a very well-funded private hospital in Memphis about six blocks up the street. And I said, what the hell is this? There's no IV, there's no paperwork. And he goes, oh, didn't we tell you, Doc? He's a transfer. He's indigent. I was livid. I was so disappointed at my colleagues up the street. I thought, how could any physician not stabilize a 19-year-old because he owed you a bill from your last ER visit? They dumped him. This was dumping at its absolute worst. Raw, in your face, go to hell, dumping. So I got this crazy idea one day and I said, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna buy dinner for two for the nurse who collects the most wristbands by the end of the summer. It wasn't long before Kellerman had collected plenty of wristbands. They would play a crucial role in transforming patient care when he testified before Congress. At the end of the hearing, I said, I've, I've described several hundred patients who are transferred, but you're used to dealing with much bigger numbers, millions and billions. But these are people, these are humans, these are Americans like you and me. And I reached under the hearing table in Congress, pulled up the bag of wristbands, and I dumped it on the table. The cameras swoop in, the congressman lean forward, the, the murmur starts. And I said, this is just 90 days of dumping of poor folks to one hospital in one mid-sized city in the Mid-South. And that became the EMTALA legislation and the requirement for people working in the emergency department to provide acute evaluation for pa all patients who present to the emergency department and to provide the acute care. That was a remarkable legislation that has had probably a, the most profound impact on the care in the emergency department. EMTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, was a landmark. It prohibited patient dumping no hospital emergency department could refuse to treat a patient because that patient couldn't afford to pay. Overnight, ERs became the health safety net for all Americans. And that's always been the mantra of emergency medicine that goes all the way back to Jim Mills. Uh, anyone, anything, anytime, we're going to be there for you. And EMTALA codified that. Uh, but really what it did was made sure that everyone was living up to those ideals. I think that I was probably a second year resident and Dr. Goldfrank went around to each of us who was working and said, I have a VIP patient coming and I want you to take care of that patient. 
And I was thinking, oh, it's probably someone from the UN or, you know, maybe it's somebody from the Secret Service, who knows. And the patient arrives. From yards away, you could smell a very strong smell of filth, feces, urine. The VIP turned out to be a woman paralyzed from the waist down, homeless, living in the underground tunnels of New York City, in septic shock, delirious, and wrapped in layers and layers of clothing. And I looked at her face, and she had a beautiful, striking face um, that was unforgettable. We realized that there was a baby, um, and that the baby was probably delivered preterm, was wrapped in a sweatshirt, which she was holding tight, and the baby had started to decompose. And the umbilical cord was still connected to the baby, and the placenta was still inside the patient. It's not clear if she understood that the baby was alive or dead. None of us had ever seen a patient in such a vulnerable state. And we just took on the task of cleaning her like it was the most important thing in the world. The number one priority for half the team was just cleaning a patient who needed to be restored to a state of dignity. But that was our VIP. Emergency medicine has come a long way since the bad old days. No longer is the emergency room the pit, relegated to the basement of the hospital. Today, it's moved closer to the hospital's front door. For most people, the ER is now the main point of entry. And for many, it's their only access to medical care. Back in 1955, just 10 million patients came to emergency rooms. Nowadays, ERs are much, much busier. By the latest count, more than 130 million patients receive emergency care every year. And where once there were no emergency medicine specialists, now they number in the tens of thousands. It's a 24-7 operation. Most specialties are contracting. But I think emergency medicine is going to see the volumes go up, and I think they're going to need the the number of emergency physicians as well as the amount of care that needs to be provided to these patients. Here we have a specialty years ago that was considered not even a specialty, but now is probably one of the most important departments in your hospital. I think emergency medicine required somebody with that ego strength and that maverick nature and that intellect to get this thing going. Those guys are the heroes. Incredible. I don't think I'd have the guts to do that. Now you're seeing the next generation of docs are becoming the CEOs of the hospitals, the medical directors of hospitals now, which would have been unheard of even 10 or 15 years ago. So we're becoming part of the establishment, but I hope we don't lose that maverick nature, or we are going to lose something of our soul, I think. I get humbled every day that I go to work. It reminds me that in the end, we're all just human beings. No one of us is any better than anyone else. We all deserve care. And that's one place where everyone can get care.